Hi, y'all. It's Angela. I'm back for another episode of Business Unveiled. And today I'm so excited to bring on a, an awesome guest because what he has started, I just wish that I would have known about this or like that it existed like 20 years ago. And we're going to talk about blogs, not vlogs, because you guys know how much I love video. But the thing with video is it doesn't pick up SEO for search engine optimization. So blogs be with a, a B as in boy, not vlogs. Okay. So I just want to make sure we're all clear here that we're going to be talking about blogging and how important it is to Today and how important it is just from like a search engine optimization using keywords in your blogging. And if you're like me, because I know a lot of us are creatives on here, we can talk and tell stories and make things look beautiful all day long. But when it comes to actually strategically sitting down and writing something, that's not something I'm good at, nor do I want to do it. And so oftentimes I'm outsourcing or paying someone else who is a great writer to interview me or I'll voice dictate something and then send it over to my assistant or a virtual assistant and they'll type it up and then they'll go put it places that it actually like matters and, and helps us make an impact out there. And so today I'm chatting with Dane Shuda. I love his last name, like Shuda. <laughs> it sounds so fun. Um, welcome to the show, Dane. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me on. I'm really excited. So before we jump in to how you became an entrepreneur um, and what has gotten you there, like, I think I was doing some reading about you and you started really understanding the mindset of like being an entrepreneur, like when you were a teenager, is that right? Welcome to Business Unveiled, the podcast designed to help you thrive in the creative community. Here's your host, events and productivity consultant, Angela Profit. What's up, GSD leaders? Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Business Unveiled, where we share expert tips and secrets from top creative industry professionals. You know we're going to take you behind the scenes of our experiences, share with you what we've learned from them, and how it's made us stronger. Because no one said it's easy owning a business, right? But it's a lot more fun when you've got a strong support team around you. And that's exactly what we do at GSD Creative. We're right there by your side. And I'm so excited that you've chosen this podcast to take the first step in growing a productive, profitable, and successful, wildly successful business within the hospitality and creative industry. Today's podcast is being brought to you by Timeline Genius. Timeline Genius has custom made templates for wedding planners, event planners. It has all of the vendor contact information in there. And basically, you don't have to do the same thing over and over. And it's fully customizable. It's tailored timelines for each and every client. You can share with the client, which can cut your emails down by hundreds a day. I know because I tracked it and I did it. And it can save you printing. You can export it to a PDF, put it in Dropbox, there's multiple pricing tiers, or you can get unlimited timelines. Give it a try, bit.ly slash AP Timeline Genius. Yeah, that's, that's pretty much right. It was, uh, so grew up in Wisconsin, small town, um, into sports, uh, kind of just pretty normal life. I was, I was kind of always attracted to things that small business owners were doing. And so I guess pretty fortunate early on, even as a young kid, to understand that I had an interest in business. So I was always kind of paying attention to business owners and, and what they were doing and, and kind of knew getting into my teenage years that that's that's kind of where I was going to focus. So always drawn to, to the area of business and owning a business. And then how, when, like, do you remember like how old you were or like around the time that you fell in love with like writing and like 
being a creative and then taking it into writing and did you go to school to be a writer like how before we even get to the business mm -hmm. portion like how did you transition that passion you know as a teenager and and mm -hmm. getting out of high school and going into college what path did you take so the writing part was very much a surprise and i and i i, I liked writing I, lo I loved reading as a kid i never really wrote a whole lot i think if you asked like my teachers from early school days if i would become any type of writer they probably would have laughed just <laughs> but i think it was more the traditional schooling you know read this book and write a report on it um type of thing like i was i was capable of doing that but not really interested but once i got to college i was kind of doing the business thing business classes but uh i remember taking a business or a elective course in creative writing. It was poetry, short stories, all kinds of creative things. And I really liked it. And so I took that class and then moved on and later got into blogging and, and kind of found that I really liked it. But, but yeah, the writing part came very much as a surprise. And then did you, meet your because I know that you said that you got married and, and married a web designer mm -hmm. and then it's like the writing and the web came together and like this beautiful business was born is, <laughs> is that what happened <laughs> kind, kind of so um, okay <laughs> so, so I got into so I graduated college I, I got a job in marketing okay and right around that time this was like 2007 8 9 uh, I would say blogging was early days but i was curious about it and and so i just kind of started writing about what i was learning at work what i was having kind of some experience with at my job and what i was doing on my own and at where at the company i worked at met my now wife and and she was in the web design side of things and and she was also interested in kind of doing her own freelance type business and so, uh, yeah, at that time, a lot of cool things were happening. We didn't know it at the time, but we were kind of getting into business and these creative fields. So, it, yeah, it was really neat. That's so awesome. So, so you guys met at work and then you got married. And then when did you all decide, okay, we're going to step away from our day-to-day -day job and we're going to start a business? Like, were these like talks that you would have at dinner or it just kind of happened or you were strategic about it because there there might be some people listening because i know for a long time for like the first 10 years of my business i had a real job like it mm -hmm. that i went to school for in healthcare, and i didn't really know like how to quit and how to get out of it and mm -hmm. how to stop because i wasn't a quitter so i just i love to hear people's stories and like what happened to like make them because that's scary like for mm -hmm. both household incomes to just quit and like go be entrepreneurs. I mean, that, that's a, mm -hmm. a really scary thing if you stop and think about it sometimes. Mm -hmm. So how did you all make that shift in starting the so, business? So yeah, so, so this would have been, so we met 2008, started dating 2009 and 2009, my wife, so she was a web designer at the company. I think she had one or two clients, I guess you could call it like on a freelance basis that she did uh, small websites for or email design. And she was doing that for about a year. And into 2010, she started to think maybe I, sh maybe I could do this full time. And I was kind of interested in, in that as well. So I, I tried to be encouraging. I uh, had, I always would have remembered hearing, I had an uncle who started a business very young and this would, this would be back in the 1970s and, and he was 24 years old and, and he had a job and he had a wife and two young kids and he quit his job to start this business for an idea he had. And I always thought, you know, if he could do it in his early 20s with a wife and two kids, there's no reason that. At the time, my girlfriend couldn't do it. You know, we had relatively right. low expenses. And, and so 
so we I, so we just kind of decided like you know why don't you give it a shot and then two years later I had kind of been blogging for a few clients on the side decided to give it a shot so she did it first in 2010 and then I kind of followed full-time in 2012 and how did you all decide that you were going to start like did, were, like how did you come up with the name of the company like hey we're just mm-hmm. gonna throw up a website and say sure. we'll blog for people like from a strategic so, uh, standpoint how did all that start to unfold because yep, i love hearing yep. people's stories <laughs> so, so it's it's two different businesses we're kind we're separate so for okay. her um i don't know at the time we kind of started very similar i don't think she had her own website at first it was kind of working for a couple clients and and then started getting a little more serious so for as far as picking her name uh just picked sarah lynn design and created a website for herself i I do remember thinking at the time this was before i had proposed or anything and she was trying to come up with a name and and i do remember thinking maybe just pick your first name and middle name because your last name maybe changing (laughs) (laughs) or at least I was hopeful um so that's how she picked her name and then I kind of followed a similar pattern it wasn't like an official business I was I was kind of doing some freelance work but I had the idea that it might become a business and once it started to show some signs of life that's when kind of came up with the name ghost blog writers as the brand and and launched a very basic website and then I've just kind of tweaked it over the years many times to, to kind of turn it into what it is now. So tell us like, how does it work? So like if somebody needs one blog written or do you all have packages where people say I need one blog a week. So we do four mm-hmm. a week and just walk me through the process. So, cause I'm sure there's so many people mm-hmm. listening where they're like, Oh my God, they're ghost blog writers. Like mm-hmm. I need this. Um, so just take me down the customer journey and how you guys serve your customers. Sure. So if, if someone is interested in blogging and, and usually what we do is, is like you said, a, like a weekly post ongoing thing. The plan is for it to be for the long term. Um, someone comes to us, we ask them questions about their business or, or who they're looking to reach. Uh, we have someone on our team that brainstorms titles. They kind of dive into finding the questions that the audience is asking and, and trying to form some titles. And from that, we usually pick one with the client that they also like and we do a first post so it's kind of on a free trial basis and we have a team of about 50 freelance writers throughout the u.s we have a couple in canada the uk and australia kind of depending on where the customers are and we'll pick a writer that we feel is going to be the writer for the long term and we'll have them write the first post we'll send that to the client have them read through it, get their thoughts, uh, make sure we have the right style, tone, and just kind of make sure we're a good fit. And if it looks like it maybe is not the right fit, we'll try a different writer. If it does look like it's the right fit, we'll kind of start setting up a, a regular blogging schedule. And usually it's one or two posts a week, uh, could be different word count. And we try to set up some website analytics uh, so that after a few months to a year, we can start paying attention to what posts are doing well and, and kind of guide the blogging strategy a little bit. But then that process just kind of repeats every month or two. We brainstorm more titles, run that by the client, get their input if they have ideas. Uh, we, we sometimes do interviews or we even have a few clients that will send over Uh, voice memos with their thoughts uh, just kind of in general and we'll use those thoughts for posts Uh, but yeah I guess that's kind of a quick overview of how it works that's awesome so I know that you mentioned like you know you were in marketing before and so Mm -hmm. how can you just give our, our audience like some quick 
tips of like how blogging can help with your marketing plan and like how is blogging a piece of content marketing and I mean I, I don't know about you guys but like we do this whole thing called wash rinse repeat or mm -hmm. I think that's what we call it mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's like I literally voice dictate or do a video and then mm -hmm. it goes into a podcast and then that goes into a blog and then that mm -hmm. goes on Facebook and Instagram, you know? So, I mean, we yep. change the conversation a little bit, but do you all support that as well? Or you just stick to like posting on people's sure. blogs period the end. And then that just helps with the content marketing plan and strategy, as you mentioned, if you'll talk mm -hmm. us through how blogging is so, so, so important mm -hmm. when it comes to that. Yeah, it's in it in content marketing in general, it, it's kind of boils down to the three mediums. So it's uh, text, video, and audio. And they can all kind of, you can kind of create one and use it to create the other. So you could start with video and use that video for a podcast and blog post or kind of do the other way around. But, but yeah, and blogging has definitely been big for SEO search engines can read through all the text content online. Uh, they're starting to be able to do podcasts and video, but text has been big. And I just read a statistic the other day where I think it was 70 or 80% of people read blogs regularly. And often they don't know it. They just kind of search for a question that they have on Google and the the result that they come across is, is often a blog post answering that question. And from a business perspective, marketing perspective, if you're trying to answer as many questions as you can for your target audience, or if you're doing some other type of content, it just gets your brand as the one that people are finding when they're searching for things online, uh, brings them to your website, if it's SEO, you can also share the content on social media, kind of repurpose it and write the blog post first and then take snippets from the post and share it on social media consistently and just kind of growing your broad reach, getting people to, to know that you exist. And then often we see as a benefit of that, people are searching for the brand name when they're interested in the service or reading a blog post and then they read the company's about page and then they read about their services and then they inquire about the services so it's kind of a broad marketing strategy like video or podcasting that just works to bring more people to your brand yeah i love that it, it's it's so true and do you find that if people are consistent that that definitely helps with with people finding them online? Yeah, yep. Consistency is, is kind of the biggest part of any type of content that I believe in, whether it's video, podcasting, blogging. The consistent schedule seems to be what leads to success. It's, it's almost impossible to predict like what a hit piece of content will be. But if you're doing it consistently, you're creating a, a good amount of content and you're learning from that. And it's kind of like just clocking into work every morning, writing a weekly blog post or whatever it might be. The, the consistency is probably the number one most important thing. Yeah, that, that's what we have found. And some yeah. of our clients, I mean, I, I sell perfection, you know, and, and, mm -hmm. but it's, it makes me laugh so hard. Like I'll go and speak to an audience or something. And at the end, someone will come up to me and say, um, the word receive was misspelled on slide 83. And I'm like, that's what you got out of my talk. Uh, okay. Well, I'm not going to change it. I don't really care. Like that. I'm not a good speller. <laughs> like you can't be good at everything. I'm not a perfectionist like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just have to let it go sometimes, but also, so I know I noticed on your website, so you guys go, go check it out, ghostblogwriters.com. And so you all offer 500 words, 1,000 words, 1,500 words, 2,000 words, you know, per post. And so mm -hmm. do you find that the ROI on a shorter word versus a longer word, can you give us some examples 
of like, do you have clients where they're like, I don't, you know, I have this topic. I don't know if it should be 500 words or 2000 words. Like Mm -hmm. how do you determine that for a client when they come to you guys and say like, we need something written? Like how many words, like, how do you even do that? (laughs) It just seems so hard. (laughs) It it does depend, but it's kind of weird. Even, you know, 10 plus years ago when I was first reading blogs and writing blogs, the, the average was always right around 500 or it was right around 1,000. And that's kind of stayed the same. So if a client comes to us and they're not really sure where to start, we usually say, why don't we start at 500 and maybe okay. experiment with 1,000 or 1,500 or maybe we'll do a 2,000 word post. But it, it can kind of depend on the topic. But it seems that blog readers are comfortable reading something that's 500 words. I kind of think it's like how a song is usually three minutes long and you're going to get songs that are longer and shorter, but these content types, they always kind of fall into kind of a certain length, whether it's a two hour movie or a half hour TV show or whatever it might be, they kind of fall into their own, length. And I think a lot of people are just comfortable with a 500 word blog post. Um, But we have clients that are successful with 300 word posts. It just kind of fits their style that they're looking for. And we have clients that only want to do 2000 word posts. And we kind of gear our topic research, knowing that they want 2000. But if you're if you're unsure, kind of the good place to start is at 500 words. Gotcha. Do you recommend, like, I know for us, you know, the big thing is like hashtags, follow hashtags. People can find you on hashtags on Instagram. Mm -hmm. You all um, guide your clients to where you try to use like 30 keywords that would be written into the blogs and then recommended using them as hashtags as well. Or is that kind of like a stupid way to think I guess <laughs> no not stupid but no not at all because because it is important and I think the, the 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 key understanding for that mindset is is that we try to do for our writers and our clients is uh what is the reader thinking about or what are they asking and and just try to use that language to make sure that they're getting the information they're looking for and I think from that you naturally get keywords from that you get hashtags and so yeah when we write a blog post we'll, it'll usually have just we try to do it naturally but have a certain number of keywords and the title will usually have a keyword and when the client shares it on social media they can usually figure out two three five hashtags to use or they may already know it kind of for their industry so we try to let it happen naturally but Sometimes we do kind of tell the writers, here's kind of a certain keyword we're thinking about for this title. Make sure to try to use it. What are your thoughts on A-B split testing keywords? So we do run into that sometimes with blog posts, more times with like a homepage copy or sales page. Um, So like for our own website, kind of gone back and forth with like blog writing services or blogging services. So sometimes I'll test like is one heading better than the other. And I'm kind of always testing that with a blog post. We don't do it as much more with sales type content. Gotcha. Like I know recently I was reading a blog post. (laughs) I Googled Mm -hmm. something because every month I'm like such a nerd. I Google like, um, you know, what are the best performing actionable words for Mm -hmm. email open rates and stuff like Mm -hmm. that. And then I came across like the top a hundred words to stay away from because it hurts the open rates. Mm -hmm. And so do you all have people that do all of that research for you or do your clients come to you and kind of tell you, or do they think they know and they really don't know? Cause that used to be me. (laughs) I'm like, I want to do this. It's kind of a mix of all. And, and email is another one where the A-B testing really works well. But what I find is that it kind of always is, it kind of goes in cycles. So like uh, 
I remember a few years ago with blogging, it, everything had to be a list and everything had to have a number and it worked for a while, still works really well. And then it kind of switched more to like how to posts and then also like what is type titles. So I feel like it kind of goes in cycles. And so what we try to do is, is try to do a mixture of the popular ones and try not to chase trends for the short term, but write a post with a title that we think is gonna be good now, but also still makes sense five years from now. So, so it, it, it seems to go in cycles where one thing gets is catchy and attention getting now might not be as popular in a year from now. So it, that part is a, is a little tricky. Gotcha. It kind of reminds me of fashion. Like one day yes. recently, I get, get my little COVID mask on and I'm like, I'm going to go to Target. And there's like all this tada shit everywhere. And I'm like, D am I in a like, I feel like I'm back in like junior high school and all the mm -hmm. stonewashed jeans and like, I don't like that style. And so I'm just like, having a, <laughs> I'm like, I'm just going to stay home with my yoga pants, <laughs> um, you know, and yep. it's okay with COVID because I don't, I don't know. Like I can, I can embrace some of it, but some of it is just like so unflattering. And so mm -hmm. it almost sounds to me like with fashion, you know, things come in and out and in and out. But the key that, that I want the listeners to understand is like, guys, you can't just put something on autopilot and let it go mm -hmm. for like a year and a year and a year and a year. It's like, you have to stay relevant. It's like, mm -hmm. I kind of, um, you know, I was kind of mad at myself because every December we go away for a week, we create content, we plan for the entire year. Mm -hmm. And so I'll never forget like March where it was like women's his history month. And we had this awesome campaign. I was super excited and it was all built out and all the emails were done and I was so overprepared and then freaking COVID came and I'm like, Shit. Mm -hmm. I have to completely either turn all this off or go back in and just update it. Otherwise I would seem like this heartless bitch that doesn't know like what's going on in the world today. <laughs> it's so, yeah, it was tough. Oh, it was terrible. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, there's worse things, but I'm just like, gosh, I feel like that was such a waste of time. So now I'm like reevaluating. I'm like, maybe we should just work like monthly or quarterly and not try to think so far ahead because you want to stay relevant with everything. Right. So mm -hmm. I'm like looking at your case studies on your website. You guys do awesome, awesome work. Are there like specific industries that you actually, like you have your favorites? Like, do you love writing for like, and, and just you specifically, I'm sure you guys mm -hmm. can service. I mean, cause you have a very large team, any industry, but what is your favorite to write for? So uh, yeah, each of the writers kind of has their favorite and that, yeah. and that's one of the neat things is, uh, so we'll get a inquiry from a client and myself or our account manager might be like, Oh, this one seems kind of boring. I don't know if anyone will be interested, but then a writer will, respond and be like oh I'm so excited about <laughs> this IT service or whatever it might be and but you usually get the ones where it's like a like a um, uber for whatever type app or like a pet app or um, a baby clothing company or something like that where people are really excited and you kind of know they're going to be excited. But uh, mm -hmm. even the boring ones, there's, there's usually a writer that gets pretty excited. We've, uh, we've done a lot in the healthcare industry the last few years where originally that was kind of a struggle, but now we have some writers that are really good in it. Software companies have been good for us over the years. They're usually pretty eager about content marketing and, and kind of bought in right from the beginning. So that that's always a plus. Um, but it's been a pretty wide spectrum of, of clients right from the beginning. Do you find that, um, I mean, I just can't even imagine like all the different things that you guys get asked for, but like, do you find that if, if somebody is not excited about a subject, but like they're going to write about it, that it's not their best work? For sure. And, and yeah, okay. if, we, if we get a client and, and the response from the writers is kind of lukewarm, and that's kind of why we do the, the trial post too, is uh, a writer may even seem excited. They do the first post, 
uh, the client says, this, this is not really hitting the mark. We might try again. Um, but usually at that point, we try to say, hey, this is not a good fit. Um, it might be better if you, if you look for a writer from a different location. We just, we don't have someone that's excited or that has the knowledge to, to make this work. So we try to catch that early on because we don't want to start blogging for the long term and it's, it's just doesn't seem like a good fit. Yeah. That's something too. Like I've noticed in our internship programs and stuff that you can just tell like when a person lights up <laughs> about mm-hmm. something mm-hmm. and like, you know, they'll work on it all night long because they're so excited. But then mm-hmm. I'm like, okay, well then there's this project too. And then they're just like so disinterested and yep. it's like, well, you know, let's just try it. And it's like, do you want to try new things? Or I also find too, when it comes to like writing, just because I'm not a good writer is that, um, the I've noticed lately the new thing is kind of like the conversational writing, like an email mm-hmm. copy and things like that. But do you all do different styles of writing where the client tells you, okay, this needs to be like a college paper or this needs to be mm-hmm. the, or is that something that you all decide? So I would say most of the time we kind of go down the middle so kind of in between the, the really bubbly, conversational, and then we don't do a, a lot of like the college essay. So we kind of stay in the middle at the beginning, but if the client says, hey, this doesn't have enough personality, usually the writer will get kind of excited because they don't always get to do that. So then they're a little more conversational. And then other times we do have clients where it's, it's they kind of want, hey, I want this to be more professional more by the book and so usually we'll start down the middle just kind of naturally with we don't necessarily direct the writers to do that but just that's kind of where they go and then usually the client will kind of decide if it should go one way or the the other and that that's usually a reflection of kind of the brand personality or the person that started the business or kind of usually that that's how it's decided. Gotcha. So tell us about owning your own content. So what does that mean? I know what it means. Yep. Yep. (laughs) So anything we create, um, the client owns the content, meaning we don't reuse it. We don't, when we write it, it's for the client only. We don't use it anywhere else. Uh, The client is free to publish it on their blog or use it on social media or turn it into a white paper or whatever. They are free to do whatever they want with it. And then they know we're not using it in any other way. And if you're asking yourself, why is this so important? I mean, there is a very well-known content creator in my space that Mm -hmm years ago was actually sued for using Mm -hmm. other people's content Mm -hmm. and then slapping her name on it. And it's like, my gosh, if you're inspired by somebody else, like at least do a link back to their site or give them credit or something. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, I read all kinds of stuff and that people will share with me, like on productivity, you know, give me great ideas of blogs that we can write. But if I get, you know, a direct, idea from someone I'll be like hey thanks so much for so and so like mm-hmm. pointing this out you know it's just like give credit where credit's due people come on um yep. but I have noticed um you know being in digital marketing how many agencies it is absurd to me how some of these large companies and I mean large meaning they're paying between six and ten grand a month for agencies mm-hmm. to create their content and then they decide, you know, two, three years later when their contract is up and this just happened recently with COVID or they can't really afford it anymore. So then they have to pause their contract and then they're learning the hard way that in the fine print, they don't own jack shit. And really, yeah, like these big healthcare agencies do it. And the mm-hmm. same thing with like the Facebook pixels and the Facebook audiences. And mm. when you walk away, all the, like you mentioned, setting up the analytics, you walk away, all that stuff is owned by the agency. And I don't, I mean, it is in, in the, mm-hmm. the small print, but like that is not a business model that I support. I think it's wrong. 
And if you're investing all that money to build your brand, my God, you should own the shit, you know? <laughs> I'm just I agree. like, yeah. oh my God. <laughs> that kind, it kind of, I've seen it a, a little bit too. And I always, when an agency or whoever is trying to, to do that, I always think, you know, that it just can't work for the long term. Like pe- brands are going to find out about that eventually. And no brand would, I don't think would want to do that because it, it should be theirs. They're paying for it. They're not just renting it. I would think yeah, but people don't, especially I see it the most in physicians okay. and they go to these big conferences and these big conventions where, you know, they pay these, these companies pay 10, 20, 30 grand to have a booth in the Bahamas. And mm-hmm. you know, it's like, Oh, you don't want to deal with your social media, pay us 10 grand a month. We'll do everything for you. And it's like Mm -hmm. these doctors, especially like the older ones, the good ones, like shit, they used to be having their faces on billboards and that's, they were in the yellow pages. Like they didn't know anything Mm -hmm. about social media and their attorney like does look, look it over. And before they know it, you know, the first year is typically like the honeymoon phase and then Mm -hmm. you might have a new office manager come in or a new consultant come in and they're like, well, what's the ROI on that? Like how many patients are you getting? And then like, we'll start digging and we'll start looking into things like this just happened recently with my chiropractor. Mm -hmm. I was like looking at his site and I was like, Hey, you've moved offices. You've been moved for like three months and your new address isn't even on your website. Like, do you know that? And he's like, really? We pay a guy six fifty a month to like keep up with all this stuff. And so I'm like, yeah, look. And I'm like, oh, and by the way, while you're looking wow. at the, my mobile screen on your website, there's no CTA and there's no, uh, you know, mm-hmm. and he's like, what's that? I'm like, a call to action, like where I can schedule an appointment. And then if I mm-hmm. click, if I scroll and I go fishing for scheduling an appointment, I'm like, you know, there's EMR systems that you can get all this hooked up to, you know, it might be a mm-hmm. hundred bucks a month, but like, like a lot of our clients, they retain people and they get new clients this way because it's an instant feed. And he's like, you know, so then I had his attention and I'm like, can you just cry mm-hmm. that first? <laughs> and then we can talk about this. <laughs> And so he's mm-hmm. like, well, can you uh, just take a look at it? And so like I made him a loom video, just, you know, deep diving mm-hmm. into using some of our little secret tools that we have. And, yep. Yep. you know, and then he's like, I forwarded it to my person that I've had for like six years and he was very defensive. And I'm mm-hmm. like, well, what did he say? I'm like, I'm not trying to take the dude's job. I'm just trying to help you. I've been coming here for f- 15 years. And he's like, well, he told me that you knew what you were doing and that girl has it going on. And why don't you just hire her? Because I'm going to, he quit. And he knew he got caught with his pants down. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, I'm like, you're on WordPress. It hasn't been updated in a long time. Like you can tell all this stuff, but you know, Mm -hmm. your average consumer doesn't know all this. And it just really makes me sad that people take advantage of people who don't understand like SEO and understand Mm -hmm owning your content. So like literally on my mobile, on the mobile version, it's like blog writing services, hundred percent original, which is super uh-huh. important and hundred percent owned by you. And I'm like, I like this company it's, it, <laughs> and I like that you just free job, period. Yeah. Yes. Cause it's, 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 uh, I think SEO has a negative connotation for a lot of people and, and it's because of that kind of stuff that goes on, but it, it's it's a good thing. You yeah, that kind of stuff though is just frustrating. Same thing, social media or or any of it. Just it can get a bad name from those kinds of situations. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like don't get taken advantage of. Mm-hmm. Um and then how how have things been for you guys in terms of business, like with COVID and working from home? I know you guys have what, a toddler <laughs> that you're raising. Yeah. During all this, so, um, how is that working? <laughs> so uh, we we've been fortunate in a lot of ways. So my wife and I have been working from home for several years. So that change wasn't huge. The toddler has been a change in all facets for us. Uh, so not just recently, but she's kind of all over the place. She's got a lot of energy, and we just try to keep up and get sleep when we can but she's great and as far as business it's been interesting so end of March April we had a few clients just kind of put things on hold just to see how things were going to go but then inquiries 
picked up like from what they normally are people interested in creating content i don't know if uh people were home and thinking about new strategies so we kind of had an increase in business i also after the initial shock i i thought maybe advertising expenses would go down and so i mm-hmm. kind of invested a little more in advertising and marketing in april and may and the costs at least in my area have kind of been half of what they used to be so i was i was kind of investing a little bit more in acquisition and mm-hmm. so so this last month has been, has been pretty good that's awesome yeah we we stopped like some facebook stuff for a couple weeks and then mm-hmm. i thought well, other people around me, they're like, why? Like wh- people are still spending money. And I'm mm-hmm. like, okay, well, I guess we'll just try again. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, people are still spending money online. So mm-hmm. I don't know why. And yeah, I mean, us too. I mean, you know, we've had some clients, obviously some of our revenue comes from events and yep, we yep. either moved them to online or we are just completely moving them back, but I'm not going to start replanning stuff until we have clear direction. Um, I'd sure, really sure. the medical community to just find a freaking cure and, mm-hmm. or a vaccine so that, you know, if you get it, it's another strain in the flu, you get a shot, you're fixed in a week, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. you're good to go. And, uh, you know, all these people dying is crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is, it, it's just, it's, it's nuts. So do you guys have people from all over the world reaching out to you or with you guys being from, it's funny, Wisconsin, I think, mm-hmm. I think of all my clients that are from there and how they say it. And <laughs> like, whenever they come here and do events, they ship all this amazing cheese <laughs> <laughs> and they have like the most beautiful charcuterie spreads ever. Mm-hmm. Um, but do y'all just mainly work with people around where you all are or do you have people all over like it's, clients yeah the clients it's for, it's weird um it's never really been a local thing okay and i don't know why if it if it was kind of my own personality but yeah clients have come mostly in the u.s but all over okay. the u.s but also it's always been throughout the world australia was it was kind of a weird one we had a lot of clients you know, five, six years ago that were from Australia. I think we got one and then they told others and it kind of grew a little bit. And then I met my account manager. She's in Australia. So we're kind of on opposite time schedules, which works out nice in a lot of ways. And we've had clients from India, the Middle East and Asia. It it kind of just depends, but it's been very global right from the beginning. Do you all write in different languages or translate into different languages? So no, usually, and that's one thing that's kind of been on my priority list a little (laughs) bit over the years, but it's never been like a top priority, but maybe I always think every year, like maybe that should be, but usually if a client from another country with a different primary language, they're usually looking for content in English to okay. reach an English speaking audience. So usually that's, that's kind of where we provide the service, but so no other languages yet, but it's, it's always on my radar. Maybe to come. Yeah. We, yeah. we really weren't into the other languages, but when COVID started, um, this one client that came to us who needed help getting all their stuff online, they had already started on a website for like Japan and um, Korea. I, I don't know. Like, I don't even, there's mm-hmm. like five different mm-hmm. languages that they're like getting their website translated into. And so we had never really gotten into that. And then when they asked, they're like, can you help us do this, 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 and this? I'm like, well, from what I hear, yeah, I mean, we can lead the project from what I hear though, like translating all this stuff, you can't just like put it in an app and hit no, go and, and no. pray that it's okay. Like, you know, we'll reach out and find people that actually speak this language because mm-hmm. we don't want to look like an idiot, <laughs> you know, like yep. in another country. Um, so it's just interesting to me how some of the pretty large companies have been looking to scale because they feel as though their reach in America and the U S and English speaking has, you know, been 
they've been pretty good at it. And so now they're, you know, mm-hmm. trying to get into other industries, you know, with this whole COVID thing. So mm-hmm. I, just, I didn't know, um, that was never a thing for us until, you know, this year. And I, it just, it's made me yep. look at things a little bit differently. And I've also been learning like, you know how like in the United States, we all look at dot coms and then, mm-hmm. you know, if it's like a dot org, typically to me, that's like some type of a nonprofit organization. And yep, so like yep. what learning is like, you know, in Canada, you have like dot CA and I'm like, oh, is that California? And people are like, no, Angela, it's Canada. <laughs> and, um, you know, like I was talking to a guy earlier from Scotland and like all theirs is like dot UK. And so people yep. in these other countries, they're like, what's a dot com? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, is this yeah. a joke right now? <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> what the United States uses? So it's mm-hmm. just um, keeping up with all of that it is always keeping us on our toes, like 100%. Yep. Um, yep. So if people want to connect with you and have an opportunity to try this out and you guys do one complimentary blog for them, like what is the mm-hmm. best way for them to connect with you? Best place would be the website, ghostblogwriters.com. should have all the information, um, but you can fill out the contact form and we'll kind of lead you through that process. I'm usually available for a call. Otherwise, would love to connect personally. LinkedIn is, is the place where I'm most active. If you just uh, search Dane Shuda, as far as I know, I'm the only one in the world. So really, should, should be able to find me. I don't, it's a, like... Like you seem to to tell, the last name Shuda is pretty unique. It is. It is. My mom also gave me the unique first name. So, um, yeah. As far as I know, I'm the only one. That's great. I know one other person named Dane. He worked at the hospital with me, but his name was spelled D A N E. Like, yep. And that's which I think is like a great name. Yeah. Yeah. So Dane and. I don't know if I've ever gotten the full story from my mom. I think she just wanted to be different. And so she added the Y. That's neat though. Like my little um, sister has a little boy named Knox because they're obsessed with UT football, like in Knoxville. Mm -hmm. Like it's so bad. It seems a little redneck to me, but um, you know, she wanted to be extra. We call it extra. And you know, his name is spelled K N O X X. And my mom's yeah. like, is that really necessary? Like, to, to pr- <laughs> and I'm like, well, mom, it keeps people on their toes. And, um, there's this funny TikTok that has all these little dogs that I saw the other day. And the lady's like, I'm going to take roll call class of nine or, uh, 2026. And she's like Lysol and Charmin and, you know, like all these quarantine <laughs> babies, you know, graduate. Yep. it was just hilarious. And then she's <laughs> like, um, Quarantina and, mm-hmm. uh, tiger king and you know just shit that's Mm -hmm. going on right now and i'm like it's so true though um so you know at least somebody can get humor out of like you know Mm -hmm. a global pandemic (laughs) yep (laughs) anyway well dane thank you so much for your insight today and thank you for sharing this amazing resource with us and I just, like I said, I wish I would have known about this years ago because I could have definitely have used it. Now, I mean, we've got somebody in-house now that, you know, we're on like a really sure. good rhythm. And, um, but mm-hmm. I know that there's probably business owners out there. And I often get the question from people that are like, should I have a blog? Like, what's the point? And I'm like, well, don't start it unless you're going to be consistent because that just to me yep. looks bad yep. <laughs> for your brand. Yep. Um, yep. You know, and so if somebody starts it and then they get too busy with business, I'm going to be like, hey, call Dane. Like, they can help you. (laughs) Yep, that's where we fill in. That's where we fill in. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. And everybody that's listening, be sure to check out the website and go get your complimentary blog and watch the ROI. And I also love Mm -hmm. that you use the analytics because the analytics definitely tell a story. And it definitely tells a story of business and how it can help, help you find new business. So everybody have a wonderful day. Thank you so much for listening and be sure to tune in next week to another episode of Business Unveiled. Have a great day, everybody. Bye. Now that you have all the tools you need to conquer the world in GSD, 
Just share this with your friends and your fellow GSD leaders. And be sure you're a subscriber so you never miss the juicy details of Business Unveiled. And you can ask Siri to listen to the latest episode, but you got to be a subscriber. Before I go, I have a huge favor to ask, and it would mean the world to me. While you're listening, snap a quick screenshot, post it to your Instagram story, tag me at GSD leader underscore and share with me your top takeaway from this episode and how it relates to you. Until next time, remember, stay productive and profitable. You've been listening to Business Unveiled with Angela Profit. Join us next time as we share our experiences to help you be more productive and profitable in your creative business. For more great resources, visit AngelaProfit.com.